Hey, good morning. Uh, continuing on with the seven factors of awakening, and I wanted to take another another day to just to do a bit more reading from the uh, the collected teachings of Ajahn Lee Demodaro. And today I will just uh, read a little bit from a few of his uh, his teachings on the practice of samadhi. A person who practices concentration benefits in the following ways. The heart of a person who practices concentration is radiant, steady, and fearless. Whatever project such a person may contemplate can succeed because the mind is a solid footing for its thinking. Whatever worldly work such a person may undertake will yield results that are substantial, worthwhile, and long-lasting. Whoever has trained the mind to be steady and firm in concentration will be solid from the standpoint both of the world and of the Dhamma. A solid heart can be compared to a slab of rock. No matter whether the wind blows, the rain falls, or the sun shines, rock doesn't waver or flinch. To put it briefly, the eight chains, the eight ways of the world, loka dhamma, gain and loss, status and loss of status, praise and criticism, pleasure and pain, can't shackle the heart of the person who has concentration. The five weevils, that is the five hindrances, sensual desires, ill will, drowsiness, restlessness and uncertainty, can't bore into such a person's heart. A heart made firm in concentration is like a tree with solid hardwood, Indian rosewood or teak, which, once it has died, is of use to people of ingenuity. The goodness of people who have trained their hearts in concentration can be of substantial use, even after they've died, both to themselves and to those surviving, an example being the Buddha who, even though he has nibbana has set an example that people still follow today. A person who practices concentration is like someone with a home and family. A person without concentration is like a vagrant with no place to sleep. Even though he may have belongings, he has nowhere to keep them. A person with a mind made firm in concentration, though, has a place for his belongings. In other words, all major and minor acts of merit and skillfulness come together in a mind that is concentration. A person without concentration is like a softwood tree with a hollow trunk. Poisonous animals like cobras or crocodile birds will come and make their nests in the hollow, lay in their eggs and fill in the hollow with their urine and dung. When such a tree dies, there's no use for it as firewood. In the same way, the heart of a person who hasn't practiced concentration is a nest of defilements, greed, aversion, and delusion, which cause harm and pain for the body. When these people die, they are of no use except as food for worms or fuel for a pyre. A person without concentration is like a boat without a dock or a train without a station. The passengers are put to all sorts of hardships. <coughs> Concentration is not something exclusive to Buddhism. Even in mundane activities, people use concentration. No matter what work you do, if you're not intent on it, you won't succeed. Even our ordinary, everyday expressions teach teach concentration. Set your heart on a goal. Set your mind on your work. Set yourself up in business. Whoever follows this sort of advice is bound to succeed. But apart from mundane activities, whoever comes to put the Buddha's teachings into practice is sure to perceive the great worth of concentration. To be brief, it forms the basis for discernment, which is the central principle in the craft taught by the Buddha, the craft of the heart. Discernment here refers to the wisdom and insight that come only from training the heart. People who haven't practiced concentration, even if they're ingenious, can't really be classed as discerning. Their ingenuity is nothing more than restless distraction, an example being the person who thinks to the point where his nerves break down, which goes to show that his thoughts have no place to rest. They run loose with no concentration. 
People with responsibilities on the level of the world or of the Dhamma should train their hearts and minds to be concentrated. Then when the time comes to think, they can put their thinking to work. When the time is past, they can put their thinking away in concentration. In other words, they have a sense of time and place, of when and where to think. People without concentration, who haven't developed this sense, can wear out their minds, and when their minds are worn out, everything breaks down. Even though they may have the energy to speak and act, yet if their minds are exhausted, they can't accomplish their purpose. Most of us use our minds without caring for them. Morning, noon, and night, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, we don't rest for a moment. We're like a man who drives a car or a boat. If he doesn't let it rest, he's headed for trouble. The boat may rust out or sink, putting all that iron to waste. And when this happens, he's in for a difficult time. When a person's mind hasn't been developed in concentration, it can create difficulties for its owner's body, as well as for the bodies of others. Thus the Buddha saw that concentration can be a value on the level of the world and on the level of the Dhamma, which is why he taught it in various ways to the people of the world. But some people are deaf, that is, they can't understand what concentration is about, or else they're blind, that is, they can't stand to look at the example of those who practice, and so they become detractors and fault finders, bearing ill will towards those who practice. Those of us who hope to secure ourselves on either the level of the world or the level of the Dhamma should thus give firm support to the message of the Buddha. We shouldn't claim to be his followers simply because we've been ordained in his order or have studied his teachings without putting those teachings into practice. If we let ourselves be parasites like this, we'll do nothing but cause Buddhism to degenerate. Thus, people who train their minds to attain concentration are of use to themselves and to others. People who don't train their minds to attain concentration will cause harm to themselves and to others. To attain concentration is like having a strategic fortress with a good vantage point. If in enemies come from within or without, you'll be able to see them in time. The discernment that comes from concentration will be the weapon enabling you to wage war and destroy defilement. Whatever is worthwhile, you will keep in your heart. Whatever is harmful, you will throw out. The discernment that comes from concentration will enable you to tell which is which. These then are the benefits reaped by those who practice concentration and the drawbacks suffered by those who don't. There are two kinds of concentration. General Sadarana and exclusive Asadarana. General concentration refers to the type of mental training found throughout the world and not restricted to any particular religion, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, or Hinduism. All of these religions are based on concentration, which can thus be called general concentration. Exclusive concentration is a type of concentration specifically Buddhist and not shared by other religions. When practiced, it gives rise to the transcendent states, the paths, their fruitions, and Nibbana. Thus, it can be called exclusive concentration. General and exclusive, though, can be understood in still another sense. General concentration means concentration that can be focused on any of your postures, sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Exclusive concentration has nothing to do with your posture, but is done exclusively in the heart. You focus attention solely on the in and out breath without getting involved in actions or speech. Your attention is directed solely to the activities of the mind. <coughs> with regard to its levels, there are three kinds of concentration. Momentary, kanaka, threshold, upachara, and fixed, apana. Momentary concentration can arise when you're intent on your work, or when you see a visual object, hear a sound, smell an aroma, taste a flavor, when the body comes into contact with a tactile sensation, or a mental notion arises to the mind, as when you become firm in your repetition of Bhutong. 
When the mind becomes still for a moment under conditions like these, this is classed as momentary concentration. <clears throat> momentary concentration is like a person diving down into a pond and then climbing up onto the bank when he resurfaces. Threshold concentration. When you practice mindfulness immersed in the body, mentally scrutinizing the parts of the body until you are struck by the fact that they are filthy and repulsive, simply compounds of the four physical properties of earth, water, fire, and wind. Thinking in this way is termed vitaka, or directed thought. To know in this way is termed vichara, or evaluation. <coughs> the mind will then come to a halt, still and at ease for a short period, and then withdraw, like a person who dives down into a pond, resurfaces, and then swims around for a while before climbing up onto the bank. This is called threshold concentration because it comes on the verge of fixed penetration. Fixed penetration, the mind is steady and firmly concentrated, paying no attention at all to sights, sounds, smells, tastes, or tactile sensations, being completely absorbed in a single mental notion. It takes shelter in a single in a subtle preoccupation, a ramana, and so is able to hide away from the five hindrances, although it can't yet kill them off absolutely. Even so, this is still termed fixed penetration, because it can be entered for long periods of time, like a person who dives down to the bottom of a pond, resurfaces, and then swims around in all four directions, that is, the four levels of jhana. All three of these levels of concentration are classed as general. They're practiced all over the world. The only form of concentration particular to Buddhism is transcendent concentration. Viewed from this standpoint, the forms of concentration are only two, mundane and transcendent. Mundane concentration is further divided into two sorts, that which is accompanied by the hindrances and that which is accompanied by the discernment of liberating insight, vipassana. Transcendent concentration is also divided into two sorts, that which has abandoned the five lower fetters, but is still accompanied by a number of the hindrances, and that which is accompanied by the realization of liberating insight, eradicating all the hindrances. The three levels of concentration, momentary, threshold, and fixed, form the basis of discernment. Both mundane and transcendent discernment have to depend on one or another of these three levels of concentration. But concentration is not what constitutes awakening. Awakening is accomplished by discernment. If discernment is lacking, no amount of concentration, however great, can lead to awakening. Once you have attained concentration, Discernment can arise in dependence on one of two factors. An experienced friend makes a suggestion that sparks a realization of the opening leading on to discernment, or external events, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, or tactile sensations strike the mind, which stirs for a moment and sets out to scrutinize them. This is called vitaka and vichara, so as to ferret out an understanding in line with their truth. If you see that any of these two kinds of events give beneficial results, then fix your attention on them and keep after them, using the power of your discernment and ingenuity to gain true insight into their nature. But if you see that your discernment is still no match for them, focus back on the original object of your concentration. If you focus back and forth in this manner, you give rise to liberating insight. And once you've given rise to liberating insight, you will attain transcendent discernment, the understanding that will enable you to abandon once and for all your self-identity views. Transcendent concentration derives its name from the discernment it gives rise to. The discernment itself is what constitutes awakening. But for discernment to be effective in line with the aims of the Buddha's teachings, it requires the backup and support of concentration. Are there any questions and comments on this first section? Okay,
one other section about uh, right and wrong concentration. <coughs> right concentration, the way to discernment, knowledge, and release. If we class concentration according to how it's practiced in general, there are two sorts, right and wrong. Wrong concentration. Why is it called wrong? Because it doesn't give rise to the liberating insight that leads to the transcendent qualities. For example, after attaining a certain amount of concentration, we may use it in the wrong way, as in magic, hypnotizing other people or spirits of the dead so as to have them in our power, or exerting magnetic attraction so as to seduce or dupe other people, all of which causes the heart to become deceitful and dishonest. Or we may use concentration to cast spells and practice sorcery, displaying powers and hopes of material reward. All of these things are based on nothing more than momentary kanika concentration. Another type of wrong concentration is that used to develop types of mental absorption falling outside of the Buddha's teachings and belonging to yogic doctrines and practices. For example, staring at an external object, such as the sun or the moon, or at certain kinds of internal objects. When the mind becomes steady for a moment, you lose your sense of the body and become fastened on the object, to the point where your mindfulness and self-awareness lose their moorings. You then drift along in the wake of the object, in whatever direction your thoughts may take you, up to see heaven or down to see hell, seeing true things and false mixed together, liking or disliking what you see, losing your bearings, lacking the mindfulness and alertness that form the present. Another instance of wrong concentration is when, after you've begun practicing to the point where you've attained threshold upachara, concentration, you then stare down on the present, focusing, say, on the properties of breath, fire, or earth, forbidding the mind to think, staring down, getting into a trance, until the property becomes more and more refined, and the mind becomes more and more refined. Using force to suppress the mind until awareness becomes so dim that you lose mindfulness and alertness and all sense of body and mind. Everything is absolutely snuffed out and still with no self-awareness. This is called the plane of non-perception, where you have no perception of anything at all. Your awareness isn't well-rounded, your mindfulness lacks circumspection and as a result, discernment has no chance to arise. This is called wrong concentration, wrong release, a mental blank. No awareness of past, present, or future. Another instance of wrong concentration is when we can give rise to momentary concentration, threshold concentration, all the way to the four jhanas, but aren't adept at entering and leaving these levels so that we focus in until only the property of consciousness is left with no sense of the body. This is called a rupa jhana. Bodily processes disappear, leaving only the four types of mental acts, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vijnana, which form the four levels of a rupa jhana. The first being when we focus on a feeling of space or emptiness, the mind attains such a relaxed sense, relaxed sense of pleasure that we may take it to be a transcendent state or nibbana, and so we search no further, becoming idle and lazy, making no further effort because we assume that we've finished our task. In short, we simply think or focus without having any finesse in what we're doing, entering, leaving, or staying in place, and as a result, our concentration becomes wrong. Right concentration. This starts with threshold concentration, which acts as the basis for the four jhanas. Beginning with the first, vitaka, thinking of whichever aspect of the body you choose to take as your object, such as the four physical properties, starting with the in and out breath, and then we chara, adjusting, expanding, letting the breath sensations flow throughout the body, 
and at the same time evaluating the results you obtain. For instance, if the body feels uncomfortable or constricted, adjust the breath until it feels right throughout the body. The mind then sticks to its single object. This is termed Ekagata. When mindfulness enters into the body, keeping the breath in mind, an alertness is present in full measure, keeping track of the causes that produce results congenial to body and mind, then your sense of the body will benefit. Bathed with mindfulness and alertness, it feels light, malleable, and full, saturated with the power of mindfulness and alertness. The mind also feels full. This is termed beauty. When both body and mind are full, they grow quiet like a child who, having eaten his fill, rests quiet and content. This is the cause of pleasure on the level of the Dhamma, termed Sukha. These factors taken together form one stage of right concentration. As you continue practicing for a length of time, the sense of fullness and pleasure in the body becomes greater. Ekagata, interest and absorption in your one object, becomes more intense because you have seen the results it produces. The mind becomes steady and determined, focused with full mindfulness and alertness, thoroughly aware of both body and mind, and thus you can let go of your thinking and evaluating, entering the second jhana. The second jhana has three factors. Ekagata, keep the mind with its one object, the breath, which is now more subtle and refined than before, leaving simply a feeling of piti, fullness of body and mind. The sensations of the body don't clash with one another. The four properties, earth, water, fire, and wind, are properly balanced. The mind and body don't interfere with each other, so both feel full and satisfied. The body feels pleasant, sukha, solitary, and quiet. The mind too feels pleasant and at ease, solitary and quiet. When you're mindful, alert, and adept at doing this, entering, staying in place, and withdrawing, side benefits will result. For example, knowledge of certain matters will arise, either on its own or after you've posed a question in the mind. Doubts about certain issues will be put to rest. As the sense of bodily pleasure grows stronger, the sense of mental pleasure and ease grows stronger as well, and thus you can let go of the sense of fullness. Awareness at this point becomes refined, and so can detect a subtle level of the breath that feels bright, open, soothing, and spacious. This enables you to go on to the third jhana. The third jhana has two factors, pleasure and singleness of preoccupation. The pleasure you've been experiencing starts to waver and flashes as it reaches saturation point and begins to change. You thus become aware of another subtler level of sensation, and so the mind shifts to a sense of openness and emptiness. The breath grows still with no moving in or out, full in every part of the body. This allows you to let go of the sense of pleasure. The mind enters the stage through the power of mindfulness and alertness. Awareness is tranquil and still, bright in the present, steady and independent. It lets go of the breath and is simply observant. The mind is still with no shifting back and forth. Both breath and mind are independent. The mind can let down its burdens and cares. The heart is solitary and one, infused with mindfulness and alertness. When you reach the stage and stay with it properly, you're practicing the fourth jhana. The fourth jhana has two factors, ekagata, your object becomes absolutely one, and upeka, you can let go of all thoughts of past and future. The five hindrances are completely cut away. The mind is solitary, clear, and radiant. The six properties, earth, water, fire, wind, space, and consciousness become radiant. The heart feels spacious and clear, thoroughly aware all around through the power of mindfulness and alertness. As mindfulness becomes tempered and strong, it turns into intuitive knowledge, 
enabling you to see the true nature of body and mind, sensations and mental acts, past, present and future. When this happens, if you aren't skilled, you can become excited or upset. In other words, you may develop the ability to remember previous lives. If what you see is good, you may get pleased, which will cause your mindfulness and alertness to weaken. If what you see is bad or displeasing, you may get upset or distressed, so intent on what you remember that your sense of the present is weakened. Or you may develop Chatu Papatanyana. The mind focuses on the affairs of other individuals and you see them as they die and are reborn on different levels. If you get carried away with what you see, your reference to the present will weaken. When you find this happening, you should take the mind in hand. If anything pleasing arises, hold back and stay firm in your sense of restraint. Don't let yourself fall into Kama Sukalikana Yoga, delight. If anything bad or displeasing arises, hold back, because it can lead to Atakilamatana Yoga, distress. Draw the mind into the present and guard against all thoughts of delight and distress. Keep the mind neutral. This is the middle way, the mental attitude that forms the path and gives rise to another level of awareness in which you realize, for instance, how inconstant it is to be a living being. When things go well, you are happy and pleased. When things go badly, you are pained and upset. This awareness enables you truly to know the physical sensations and mental acts you are experiencing and leads to a sense of disenchantment, termed nibida jnana. You see all fabrications as inconstant, harmful, stressful and hard to bear, as lying beyond the control of the heart. At this point, the mind disentangles itself. This is termed viraga dhamma, dispassion. It feels no desire or attraction. It doesn't gulp down or lie fermenting in sensations or mental acts, past, present, or future. It develops a special level of intuition that comes from within. What you never before knew, now you know. What you never before met with, now you see. This happens through the power of mindfulness and alertness, gathering in at a single point and turning into asuakaya jnana, enabling you to disentangle and free yourself from mundane states of mind in proportion to the extent of your practice and so attain the transcendent qualities beginning with stream entry. All of this is termed right concentration, being skilled at entering staying in place and withdrawing, giving rise to right intuition, correct, profound and penetrating, right view, correct views in line with the truth, and right practice, in which you conduct yourself with full circumspection in all aspects of the triple training, with virtue, concentration and discernment coming together in the heart. This then is right concentration, for the most part, people who have attained true insight have done so in the four jhanas. Although there may be others who have gone wrong in the practice of jhana, we'll achieve the proper results if we study so as to gain an understanding and adjust our practice so as to bring it into line. Okay, any questions or comments on this part? The sermon with John is really important, it sounds like. Um, I think I recently heard the David Dhaka had all the Johns, but he went straight to hell. So it's like kind of eye opening. Yeah, well, because sometimes the, uh, uh, especially the uh, old translations, uh, and assumptions because uh, I mean they actually translated this trans uh, so it's, uh, uh, or even I'll say like a 
world, but one isn't actually paying attention. Um, so that, that that's not the point of, of the job. The, the, uh, the, the purification of mindfulness is the is more the the uh, the purpose of the of the uh, say concentration and samadhi practices. Uh, and tranquility practices of, of the Buddha, so that there's a yeah a, a heightened uh, alertness and, and attention paid to moment to moment experience, <coughs> um, and that uh, is what leads to uh, those hand in hand with relinquishment. Final comments or uh, questions? Okay, so uh, yeah, I just uh, just have those two uh, those two teachings to share for today. So uh, maybe we can just end uh, a few minutes early. Today.